I get to introduce our first keynote of the conference and of the day, and that is one of the co-creators of Apache Pino, co-founder, CEO of Startree, my boss, Kishore Gopalakrishna. He's gonna to talk to us today about the power of real-time analytics, whether we are gonna stay ahead or be left behind. Kishore, welcome to the stage. Hello everyone, and welcome to Real-Time Analytics Summit. I'm absolutely thrilled to be here, and I hope you're all too. Last year, if you remember, we spoke about the rise of real-time analytics, and we highlighted a lot of companies that are leading this change. A lot of things have changed since then. Many more companies have adopted real-time analytics and are reaping the benefits. In today's fast-paced world, real-time analytics is not just needed to stay competitive. It's absolutely essential. So that's what we are going to talk today. So let's dive in and see how we all can embrace the power of real-time analytics to stay ahead and not get left behind. Most of the time when I bring up this topic with someone, I kind of see the individuals win with two distinct mindsets. One of them is a believer who is already up and running. They're already leveraging the power of real-time analytics. They're reaping all the benefits. On the other hand, we have skeptics who are like, is this really for me? Is there value in real time? And there's nothing wrong with this. I think pretty much every paradigm shift or any new technology revolution kind of has this. And today's talk is actually dedicated to the skeptics. And there are two reasons why I'm doing this. First, I myself was a skeptic 10, 15 years ago. I didn't really believe in real-time analytics. Uh, the last year's talk was kind of, uh, talks a lot about that story. Two, I also believe that the skeptics, once they get converted into believers, they become the biggest champions of this technology. So that's exactly what we are going to do today. But how do we go about it? It's very important for us to understand their mindset, their thought process, what kind of questions do they have. So let's begin there. The first thing that they ask is, what is real-time analytics? Well, this question was kind of okay 10 years, 15 years ago, but today it's as funny as like a fish asking, what's water? Uh, because it's kind of real-time analytics is there everywhere. But the skeptics, they don't believe it even if I say this. They need some examples. So let's look at this. So if you have come here today and if you have used Uber ride and you are looking at like, how long does the ride take for you to reach, that's basically coming from real-time uh, analytics. Or if you have posted anything on the social media and you're looking at the likes, impression, and all these things getting updated in real time, that's another example. If you're into stock market, if you're looking at the trends, you're looking at the market volume up and down, all these things, I mean, this is a very old example, but that's also a real-time uh, analytics. And there are many, many, many such examples. And the last one here is the one in sports. If you're watching a sports game and you're actively looking at the stats, behind the scenes that someone is crunching the numbers for you, that's another example. So in today's world, I don't think you can get by a day without actually experiencing real-time analytics in your real life. So once we have that, let's quickly get into the definition of real-time analytics. So it's kind of it, two words in this. Uh, the word analytics, I mean, pretty much every, all of us know it's really the process of translating an event or some kind of a data into insights, right? But the real time really refers to how long does it take? It's a very important thing. The time it takes to go from an event to an insight. Now that can be anywhere from milliseconds to seconds to all the way to days. But real time really refers to a specific part of this. So you have to go from your events to insights within milliseconds or sometimes in up to a second. Anything beyond that is mostly considered as batch. Now you can have other terms like micro batching and things like that, but in essence it's batch. But why is this important? This is important because the value of an event when it occurs is the highest and it gradually and it de decays exponentially with time. And in fact, within minutes some of, the, some of the events lose their value. So it's very important for us to capture this value as soon as it, uh, uh, the value of this event as soon as it occurs. 
And for this to happen, it's not enough for us to just uh, log the event and then store them. You got to be able to query that event as well. So let's see how what what's the next question that once they get to know the definition of real time analytics, it's do I really need real time analytics? Is it a nice to have? Is it a must have? This is the most often question that I get asked. This kind of reminds me of this other cartoon here, um, kind of something that I experienced back at LinkedIn as well. So we are all so accustomed to the, the processes that we have in today, and we are always busy, and we are kind of also accustomed to the pain it brings. Um, so if you, uh, one thing that I remember back at LinkedIn, uh, we used to have this need to generate the reports by 3 o'clock in the morning. And exactly at 12 o'clock, we would start processing the entire day's worth of data to generate the reports that the execs get. And most of you can actually probably relate to this. A lot of companies are still in this mode. And for us to catch up with this, we had to keep adding more and more Hadoop nodes uh, for us to make sure that the reports get generated. But contrast that with something like having real-time processing. You can pretty much have the report at any time, and you don't have to worry about it. And you can slice and dice. You can get all the things that you need. And this is not common for real-time analytics. We had pretty much the similar uh, uh, phenomena back in 15 years ago when people said, we don't need streaming. Um, I, I've heard this many times back when Kafka originated at LinkedIn. Most people said, like, we don't really need this. But look at what has happened in the last 10, 15 years. I mean, it started at, at LinkedIn. There were very few companies leveraging Kafka. And now, in 2020, there were almost like 10,000 companies leveraging Kafka. And now there are so many different technologies like Kafka. Right? You have Kinesis, Red Panda, um, Pulsar, Event Hub, PubSub, Kinesis, a lot of them. And if you kind of look at it, there are almost hundreds and thousands of companies having streaming technology today. And that's not just with streaming technology. You kind of have this other data point which says what amount of data that's getting generated today is available in real time. Right? And if you kind of look at this graph, just four or five years ago, the only 5% of the data that was getting generated was available in real time. And today, it's almost 25 to 30%. Right? And this is the phase where this is growing exponentially in terms of the amount of data that's getting generated and is available in real time. But why is this happening? Right? Why is this sudden rise in real time analytics? Why are more and more people not just generating data, but also making it accessible in real time? And one of the main reasons is the rise of on-demand economy. So we are all impatient for information right now. We need it right now. And that's kind of what is driving this rise of real time analytics. And two things that are actually acting kind of in conjunction to drive this demand. The first one is definitely the expectations have changed. People want everything now. I need it fast. And on the other hand, you also have the technological revolution. Right? So we didn't have iPhones before. We, we didn't have all the information that we need on the tip of our fingers. So that's changing. And that is forcing all the businesses to adapt fast. So now they have, on one hand, the technology is evolving rapidly. On the other hand, the consumers are expecting more and more from, from a lot of these organizations. So the businesses have to adapt to this. But they cannot just take their existing system and try to adapt to the new modern day needs. So they need to embrace event-driven architecture, real-time processing, and real-time OLAP. So there are a lot of changes that the businesses need to actually go through in order to adapt to these changes. And it's very important to do that. And here is an example of what happens when you actually embrace this technology. Right? So this is a uh, use case from Uber Freight. Um, so this is a very simple thing where they're actually, for the drivers and the carriers, they're providing real-time scoring. Right? How quick are you? How prompt are you? And how, how good are you on the schedule? And making sure that the drop-off happens at the same time. And if you kind of look at it, just providing a simple progress report to these drivers has helped them like 0.4 percentage less in the cancellation plus 1 percentage in on-time on drop-off. So there's a lot of business value in doing this. So it's not just about you making sure that you're giving what your customers want. The businesses in turn are actually benefiting from that. And if you look at it, they had like 1.5 million 
dollars in performance improvements and cost savings, right? So this is huge. So there is a lot and lot of use cases like this where you can actually benefit uh, by embracing real-time analytics. And it's not just Uber and LinkedIn and others. There are many other companies who are already on this path. So tons of companies. And if you kind of look at it, it's not restricted to one industry. You have retail, fintech, all these different industries have already embraced. So there's a lot to gain here. And if you are one of them who are not doing real-time analytics or don't have the access to data in real time, you are definitely missing out on something. So it's real-time a must-have? Absolutely must-have. You will you'll definitely uh, get left behind if you are not embracing this. So what's the next question? So once they kind of understand this, okay, yeah, these, all these companies are doing this, I will also start getting, uh, start, uh, get started on real time. The next thing that comes to their mind is, oh, is it expensive? Um, like I'm, I'm comfortable with the batch, I know the cost, is it really expensive to actually move? I want to um, tell a story from back in 2009. I don't know how many of you were in, at Yahoo at that time. Uh, this was in 2009 when I was there. We really had this T-shirt. Um, this, the t-shirt read like, every time we log an event, a kitten dies. And this was to uh, discourage us from logging events. And that's how severe and how expensive it was uh, 15 years ago for us to log an event. And fast forward today, that's, we never think about logging an event today. Right? Uh, we pretty much log everything. Um, even if you don't want to, we were just logging everything. And that was possible by the technology revolution that happened in the last 10, 15 years. And definitely Kafka, Red Panda, and all these things are all these systems are making it a lot more easier. Right? And really what is happening is it's not that 15 years ago we didn't want to log these events. It was just the cost was very high. And that's what changed with technologies like Kafka and others, that the cost of logging an event drastically reduced. And this is a very important thing for us to understand because now this allows us to capture a lot of data from the user and also make, make and also leverage the data. Right? And a lot of these, I mean, I remember in LinkedIn, if you kind of look at one page, there are almost close to 1,000 events that get emitted. So that's the scale at which we are uh, tracking and logging events. But as I mentioned earlier, real-time analytics is not just about logging the data and storing them. What about the query cost, right? So the cost of query is, was the next problem that had to be solved because you are going to query a lot of these data because you are ask, asking these questions in real time and answering them. So what about the query cost? And that's kind of the challenge that we faced uh, back at LinkedIn when we first attempted to do, uh, build real time applications. Uh, who viewed my profile, most of you probably are familiar with it. Uh, but when we first built it uh, using other technologies like Search and Lucene, we needed 1,000 nodes for that. And once we built Apache Pino, we went from 1,000 nodes to 75 nodes. And also, the traffic grew five times during that time period. So you can calculate like, the order of magnitude in terms of how we have reduced the cost per query in, by moving from traditional technologies to, uh, to something like Pino. Not just that, I want to also give you a comparison. I mean, yes, Snowflake and the Pino are solving completely different problems. But I wanted to highlight the power of providing something like this. Uh, if you're familiar with Snowflake, obviously all of you are, it took almost 10 years for them to serve 1 billion queries per day. And we are just four years old, and just on our cloud product, we are already serving 1 billion queries. And if you kind of look at the cost per query, again, I, I know most of you are smart, so I'm not going to, I'm going to just give you an ex uh, exercise here. I mean, Snowflake has 8,000 customers and 2 billion in revenue. And we are nowhere close to that, uh, but we are already doing that many, that many queries per second. So you can guess the order of magnitude by which we are actually more efficient on a per query basis. So the question to ask here is, how did we do it? What's the secret behind, behind such efficiencies that you can actually get on a per query basis? It really comes down to the power of indexes. I mean, this is something that we had to rea we realized after looking at all the existing systems and indexes were very hard to solve prior to this because of we didn't have the ssds so once we had ssds this was another uh, thing that we can actually break through and the power of indexes actually shows in terms of the re reduction in the cost per query 
So the idea here was most of the systems before uh, Pino, they used to do the same work, but they tried to do it faster. They had MPI systems, they had vectorizations, they had more parallel systems, but the amount of work was never reduced. And that's kind of what changes with indexes. So you kind of drastically reduce the amount of work done. And what this allows, us, allows you to do is serve more queries and also get the best out of your resources that you have. And if you kind of look at it, we have indexes for a lot of different use cases. Right? You have not just the inverted, classic inverted, we have the sorted, text, geo, sparse, range, you name it, for every use case, you have a different type of index. Again, this is another example of uh, Uber moving from Elasticsearch to Pino, and they had a $2 million saving on this is just one app where they were tracking the mobile app crashes. It's a very simple app, but it took nine, more than 20,000 uh, cores for them to actually solve this. And you kind of have savings of 19,000 cores that almost amounts to $2 million per year. So this, this is a story that is, we keep hearing again and again when people move from the traditional systems that they're using for real-time analytics to something like Apache Pinot. This is another example of Beacon Stack, again, moving from Elasticsearch to Pinot. And if you kind of look at it, it's a huge improvement, like 20x improvement, and also 90x, 90% reduction in, in the infrastructure footprint. So the best part about all these things, it's not just that they're saving cost, you can also see the amazing improvement in the number of, uh, in the latency as well. So you're kind of getting the best of everything. You are improving the performance. At the same time, the cost is going down drastically. And that allows you to do many more things with the same amount of infrastructure. Another example of Cisco. Um, this is again moving from Elasticsearch to Pino. And you can see how much data they're ingesting on a daily basis and the amount of nodes that are, they're able to save. So again, a lo lot of these informations are also available. You can actually look at all the details on what are all the things that happened to actually get this amount of savings. So all in all, if you come back to the question, is real-time expensive? Yes, it used to be, uh, but thanks to all the things that has happened in the last 10, 15 years, it's no longer the case. And again, this is where we, we made this change back at, back at LinkedIn. Kafka reduced the log of uh, cost per uh, event, and similar thing happened with Pino, where the cost per query reduced drastically. And that, uh, that allows you to now, there is no excuse for you to not do this. You should definitely be able to capture all these events in real time and capitalize on it. In fact, we are in a stage right now where if you're not doing real time analytics, that's actually a lot more expensive. So what's the last question? And this is typically the last question that comes up after all these things, like, is it complicated? I, I don't have the resources. I don't have the skill set, et cetera. Um, unfortunately, yes, it is not easy. I think this is uh, one of the things that happens whenever you have new technologies come in play. Uh, but that's changing. Uh, but before we get into how we solve that, let's try to understand why it's complicated. Right? And if you kind of go back to the batch world, this is kind of how everyone used to have the, uh, the architecture, right? So you had this uh, classic old TP database, the old uh, Oracle or anything else, and you used to have a daily snapshot that used to come into your data warehouse or in the new data lake. And that's kind of changed uh, as we wanted things in real time. So you are able to capture this in this, the CDC logs and event sources like Kafka were able to publish, you were able to publish those locks into that system, and you had a consumer that would pull that and then write it into, into the data lake. But there were a lot of things that you had to learn for this. You have this concept of offsets, checkpoints, transactions. So these were all completely new for a lot of developers. It's not your traditional SQL API. At the same time, it was not following the standard JMS protocol. Right? So this is all new stuff. And kind of writing is exactly one's processing system here that pulls from one system to another system is almost as complicated as building another distributed system. So these things were very hard. Definitely there were other initiatives here. I mean, we had a lot of other frameworks like SAMSA, Flink, and others. But even then, this is very, very hard. It's not easy. 
And most people start off thinking, oh, stream processing is just, I take an event, I make some modification, and then write to another system. Uh, that, that's very, very far from the truth. Uh, but the good news is we have a lot of, lot of companies trying to make it easy. Right? And we are uh, Confluent trying to make Kafka easy, Red Panda, Kinesis, Amazon, all of these people are actually, they know the power of these technologies, but now with the rise of services, we are actually making, trying to make them easy. Right? So same thing on the real-time uh, processing framework. You have materialized delta stream, uh, decodable, rising wave. Many other companies are actually making this easier by providing a SQL API on top of it so that you don't have to understand the low-level details. You can actually uh, build your jobs using a very simple SQL API. But we want to take it to the next level. And if you kind of remember this, Kafka turned this, uh, the whole uh, concept of turning tables into streams. And that's kind of what they refer to as turning database inside out. Um, this is really, really good. And this was a very important shift. Uh, but what we can do now is turn that back outside in. Right? So now you can go back to your tables that you are already familiar with, go back to the APIs that you are familiar with in terms of the SQL API. You don't have to worry about how does it actually come from your source into the system? We, are, we take care of exactly once. We take care of the checkpoints. All those things are automatically embedded within Pino. In fact, Pino was the first system where the consumers of, this, of Kafka was embedded directly in the system. So you don't have to worry about it. And you don't have an additional hop of data when you're going from, his, uh, from the source to the sink. So a lot of awesome things here that makes it a lot more easier for you to actually consume these services and adopt real-time analytics. So it's, to answer the question, is real-time complicated? Yes, it was, but it's not anymore. There are a lot of people out here, out, out there in the, in the booth area as well, that are actually trying to make it a lot more easier. To wrap this up, I mean, is, was real-time a must? Uh, was a must have? Absolutely it is. Is it expensive? It's definitely a lot more expensive now not doing it. Uh, is it complicated? Yes, it was, but it's not that, that's not the case any longer. But this was, answers to these questions were slightly different. If you had asked me like five, 10 years ago, uh, this was not the case. But there was one thing that happened that helped us get this, and that's the Apache Pinot community. I couldn't th thank them enough for helping us get here. Without them, there was no way we could have solved all these problems alone. So I want to really extend my gratitude to the entire Apache Pinot community for helping us, providing all the inputs, all the contributions for, uh, for us to get here. We started very small. This is kind of the journey when we, we had uh, open source this back at LinkedIn, and then uh, we contributed to ASF uh, in 2018, 2019 timeframe. We were just shy of 100 members in, back in 2020. Right? And fast forward today, we are almost close to 10,000 members in the Slack community growing rapidly. Thousands of companies are already leveraging this technology. Lots of meetup groups all over the world doing the discussions and sharing all their uh, learnings as well. And if you kind of look at the Docker downloads, like 50,000 Docker downloads when we started, and we almost have like 11 million plus today. So a lot of growth in, and amazing to see this vibrant community. This is my go-to place pretty much every day. And I really love the community. So thank you again. We did a lot of things in the Apache Pino 1.0. Uh, this was one of the major release. And if you kind of look at it earlier, Apache Pino didn't have the ability to do joins. And this is where you had, had, had to denormalize the data before you pulled into Apache Pino. And that has changed now. So if you kind of look at it, we were compromising on the, on the query flexibility. So you had to denormalize it before you bring it into Pino. And that's completely changed with 1.0. So now you can cover the whole spectrum. And not just that, we have done some amazing improvements in the join algorithm as well. So now you don't have to compromise on the performance because we are actually leveraging the indexes in joins, which is very different from the traditional databases. Uh, so again, going back to the power of indexes and being able to leverage them in joins by doing semi-joins whenever possible, co-located, co-partitioned, you are able to actually get subsequent latency. And the best part is, if you are denormalized, if you, earlier if you denormalize, you had to pay a cost. You would have to have minutes or even hours of delay. And you don't have to do this. You can point multiple streams of Kafka or any other system uh, from Pino, and then you can start performing joins on that directly. 
We cannot have a keynote um, without talking about Genai in today's world. Pinot is no separate, uh, no different here. So we do have the support for vector search. Uh, we just uh, open source added this to the open source in 1.1. And we have all the vector functions, the vector indexes. Again, indexes is like the first class citizen in, in Pino. So adding another index is not really hard for us. We already added the HNSW. We're going to keep adding more and more indexes as we learn. And if you kind of look at it, we have the vector data type as well. So overall, the system is built in a way it's very extensible. Um, so we will continue to add more and more vector indexes as well. And if you, as you can see the, the syntax, we are following the Postgres uh, syntax here. So you, you will basically get the PG vector kind of index, uh, syntax that you can actually leverage for your Gen AI stuff. We have an amazing, exciting roadmap here. And the first one I wanted to call out is really the Postgres wire compatibility. Um, again, this is something that is probably the most asked feature in the community. And again, this is also in line to make things easier for people to adopt. I mean, Postgres has been like very popular. So making sure that all the clients and all the tools uh, can actually work with Pino, that's a big boost. So you can connect all your existing visualization tools, your uh, JDBC drivers, et cetera. Lots of query improvements in place. Uh, we will have other sessions that will cover the query improvements. Uh, but overall, we will be adding a lot of more functionality to get us closer and closer to full ANSI SQL. So you will get lots of windows, joins, lateral joins, all those things will be coming in. We will continue to enhance on the storage and indexing. So we, will, we have to continue to do this for a long time and we, that is, that's going to continue to happen. Uh, last but not the least, the workload isolation. As we see more and more teams within the organizations uh, trying to use Pino, one of the things that has been asked is multi-tenancy. How can we actually serve a lot of use cases in a single cluster? Uh, this is already possible, but we are going to try to make it even better and easier. Last but not the least, again, once again, I want to take this opportunity to thank the entire Pino community. Uh, so thank you uh, for all the contributions and everything that you have done so far. And we look forward to continuing more work, awesome work together. And this is where Startree comes in, right? We don't want to stop here. We want to take it to the next level. We want to make it even more easier, even more faster, and even more cost effective, right? And if you kind of look at it, we start off first with the ecosystem of integrations. Because we realize in today's world, it's not just one system that can solve all your problems. So you have to work very well with the entire ecosystem. And that's where, if you kind of remember, Pino started with just integration with Kafka, Avro, and Hadoop. That, that was the system that was there at LinkedIn. But fast forward today, you have all these other systems in terms of Kafka, Red Panda, you, can, you name it. All these ecosystem, um, all these partners are in, very well integrated. And the best part is you don't have to write a single line of code to get the data in, into, into Startree Cloud with, uh, for, from any of these systems. So we have the data manager, which allows you to simply point at these sources, and we automatically start syncing in. And we have all these jobs run in background uh, in order to import all these data. So this is automatically done. It's a no code. Um, pretty much you get the preview out there. This is also available on, in, in one of our uh, booth demos. So please um, take a look at it and see how easy is it to actually go from one, you know, for the data to move from one system to another. We have also introduced the write API. Um, so this allows you to actually write from other systems. Uh, Pino just had the pull API earlier where you can point at the system. Now we also have the write API. So you can actually write from other things like Flink and other systems. You can directly use your JDBC driver to actually insert data into Pino. On the visualization side, we have ad added more connectors. We used to have superset, streamlit, and retool support. Now we have the Tableau and the Grafana as well. And if you remember last year, we kind of started off with two deployment models. So we have this uh, bring your own cloud model and the dedicated SaaS. So these were the two models. It was very, very popular. And then we also had support of, for these on all these different cloud, AWS, GCP, and Azure as well. Uh, but over a period of time, our customers and our users are asking for, hey, we, wanted to start, we want to start small. Is there a way for us to start small and not have a completely dedicated instance? And this was amazing for us to actually hear from the users because we are seeing a lot of different variety of users from the small companies to mid-market to all the way till the enterprise. 
and I'm super excited to actually announce our new product offering, the Startry Serverless. You can get started immediately, so you don't have to even wait for the cluster to be provisioned. So you can simply go and register and you already have the cluster up and running, right? And you get a workspace and it it's automatically scales behind the scenes. So you don't have to worry about as you add more workload, you don't have to think about the capacity planning. And the best part is you actually get a better performance in this because you have a larger pool of nodes serving your workload. Instead of even in your dedicated system, you will probably have few nodes. So you kind of get all these three things. You can get started very quickly. It's easy to scale automatically behind the scenes and you get a much better performance. And to talk more about this, we have Victor actually talk and uh, describe the entire experience with this application. Hello there, I'm Victor Gamow of If Star Tree, and I'm here today to tell you everything you need to know about our new free tier in Star Tree Cloud. Imagine being able to store and query two decades of stock exchange data, millions of e-commerce transactions, or even last night production logs, all at no cost. Our cutting edge serverless architecture enables everyone to run a half million queries daily and it's free forever. No more 30-day trials. You can keep it as long as you like. When you sign up today, you will immediately receive access to our new free tier. Sign up process takes seconds and your Pinot cluster will be available immediately. With Startree free tier, connect your Kafka topic and in the minutes start crafting visualization that could dazzle your team and catch your boss eye. And who knows, this could be a step up towards that promotion you'll be eyeing. Startree Cloud Free Tier comes with Data Manager, a serverless no-code solution for ingesting data into Pinot Cluster. Interface is totally visual. You can import data from all sorts of places without writing a single line of code. We will use a Kafka topic in our case. And before you know it, your data is ready in the cluster and set for any analysis you plan to do. The data is in. Running a few queries can give you a quick sanity check to ensure everything as it should be. It is a real snap with Query Console. Whatever you're ensuring your data integrity or eagerly anticipating your first insight, those initial queries offer first glimpse into your structured and queryable data. Remember the dashboard to dazzle your coworkers I mentioned at the beginning of this video? With the power of Pino, it's time to transform those regular boring status meetings with your business intelligent folks into a showcase of real-time insights. Handling so much data so often used to be a considerable challenge, but now things have changed. This dashboard is backed by Startree free tier. You don't need to worry about shutting down your cluster in just a few weeks and there will be no more endless discussions with finance team to get budget approvals. This is what real-time data analytics looks like. Simplified, efficient and entirely within your reach. We're excited to see the innovative application you built. With this, my name is Victor Gamov and as always, have a nice day. Awesome. Thanks, Victor. Uh, to, just to re recap, so we have, we already had the dedicated SaaS offering and the BYOC, and now we have the free serverless offering as well. And the best part is we are also making the pricing public. This is the first time we are actually announcing our prices as well. And you can see how easy it is to get started on all these different versions. This also comes with a lot of things packed behind the scenes. So one of the things, as you all know, Apache Pino, the open source version can only work with local disk and local storage. And that's completely changed with the Startree Cloud. We can actually work directly on S3 APIs. And the data can be on S3, and we, we directly use the low-level S3 APIs. And the storage and compute are decoupled, so you can actually scale each of them independently. And the best part is we have done an amazing amount of research and R&D here and we used concepts like pipelining and others, and we are actually able to get sub-second latency even when the data is in S3. So there is a lot of things here to actually capture, uh, leverage, so please check it out. 
There is another cool thing that I'm super excited about announcing as well. So this is a private preview of the observability stack. Um, so now with a lot of customers and users asking us that, hey, Pino is really fast. Can we actually ingest metrics, logs, and traces, and all these other data? And that's kind of one of the things that we have added. So now you can ingest your Prometheus metrics, JSON logs, and your traces, hotel traces, into Pino. And we have introduced the concept of new data types called map, JSON, and even thanks to Uber for, for this contribution of the compressed log processing, you can save, get amazing amount of compression on your logs, almost close to 150x in terms of the compression for logs. And the maps and JSON data types, we automatically infer the schema. We separate out what are the dense columns, what are the uh, sparse columns, and we have a sub efficient storage there. On the consumption side, we have also made the integration super easy with other tools. Um, so earlier, we used to have only the REST and the SQL APIs. Now for the tools like Grafana and Superset and others, you can actually use the PromQL APIs, the GlockQL, and as well as the TraceQL APIs as well. So this allows you to easily connect with other tools that you're already familiar and get going off, um, off the bat very quickly. We also have a private preview for this. So please uh, reach out at the booth and then you get an experience of how this end-to-end -end stack looks like. Um, another quick announcement here, um, the third IGA. So this is a flagship product that we have on top of the data in Pino. So those of you who are not familiar with third eye, it's an anomaly detection and a root cause analysis tool that you can monitor all your business data. And the best part is it not just tells why, what is the problem, but it also helps you in identifying the root cause. It correlates with a lot of things that are happening in your company. Um, again, we have an amazing demo here um, at our booth. Uh, to conclude, um, I kind of have been in this journey in terms of making the leap from uh, batch to real time. I know it is daunting. I know it is not, it's not easy. But as you saw, a lot of companies have adopted this technology and are reaping the benefits. So in this highly demanding economy, you have to embrace this change or you will be left behind. And please take this opportunity to embrace these technologies and we are all here to help. And last one thing before I leave is the best part is we announced the free forever tier, but just for today and tomorrow, we are increasing the capacity to 500, 500 GB. So make use of this opportunity. It's only for today and tomorrow, and you, you can sign up at our booth. Again, thank you all for being here, and I hope you all enjoy the rest of the sessions. Thank you.